Well, all right, everybody. Uh, again, good to have you with us. If you're our guest, just want to say welcome home. It's good to have you. My name is Pat. I'm the pastor here. And uh, you picked a really good but bittersweet day to be here. Uh, today, it's the final installment, or maybe I can just frame it this way. Uh, the credits at the end of the movie are about to roll. Uh, this is the last week of our At The Movies series until maybe next summer, and uh, so we're going to have a great time today. But before we get into our film and where we're going, I, I do want to take a moment, and I want to say thank you to our team, to our volunteers who get here early every single Sunday, who set things up, who pop the popcorn, get the sodas cold, put everything out, set the table so that all of us can have a wonderful experience and time when we come to this great series. And so I would love to do this. Church, can we show our volunteer team our appreciation for all their hard work this morning? Thank you, guys, so, so much. Um, and as you know, if you've been here, you know this. If you haven't, with the Olympics happening, uh, we've decided to make our At The Movies theme with the films that we are watching. It is all Olympic movies. And today, we're going to close out with yet another uh, Olympic-themed film. And our movie for today is one that's really based on an incredible true story uh, of a courageous man, an inspiring man that inspired and changed the narrative for a lot of people, a lot of athletes. And uh, rather than me kind of setting up the movie and telling what it's all about, I thought maybe today we could just view the trailer and then jump off from there. So if we can, let's roll that trailer this morning. All right. Uh, I'm so excited about today. Yeah. I'm, this, I'm going to tell you, I, I, some movies I don't recommend, uh, but this, I cannot recommend this one highly enough. Such a powerful story. This is the story, obviously, of Jesse Owens, or as he's nicknamed, the Buckeye Bullet. Uh, it's a truly great story, inspiring. Again, I encourage you all uh, to watch it. And believe it or not, this story started right here in our own state at Oakville, Alabama. On September 12, 1913, Jesse Cleveland Owens was born right in Oakville, Alabama. And here's what I have to say. If you were born in Oakville, Alabama in the early 1900s, it was a struggle. But I'll say, if you were African American and born in 1913 in Oakville, Alabama, life was especially a struggle. Life was unfair. Economic opportunity were, it was really few and far between. Life was difficult for the Owens family, and if you watch the film as it opens, you understand and you see that for the Owens family, they struggled in a lot of areas, in most areas, to put food on the table, they struggled to survive, but as we're going to see here in just a moment with our first clip, Jesse's mom believed this about Jesse, that he was born for greatness, that he was born to do great things, that all of this adversity and all of the difficulty that they endured as a family, that he endured as a young child, and, and even with the racism that they endured as a people, that even though it was difficult, all of this adversity would produce something beautiful. And it would not only change his life, but through his life, he would lift others, and he would open the door for others, and he would help other people to see a different perspective of people that was desperately needed, especially at that time. And so today, let's start with this first clip and meet Jesse Owens. You heard Jesse's mom say it. She believed he was born to do great things. Jesse was the 10th. I did not misspeak there. He was the 10th of 10 children in his family. He was the last born to Henry and Mary Emma Owens. And let me just say this. Can you imagine having two basketball teams under your roof? right, under a tiny home. It was a lot. Jesse was the son of Henry, who was a sharecropper, and Jesse's grandfather was a slave in the horrific chattel slavery industry in our country. Jesse's dad being a sharecropper meant this, that his family was poor. And when I say poor, I just don't mean uh, didn't have a little bit. I mean like poverty-stricken poor. Every day was filled with struggle. For the Owens family, food Shelter and clothes, those were the Owens family. Beyond that, everything else could not be afforded, especially medical care. Now, Jesse as a child was very frail, suffering from bronchitis and pneumonia often, uh, and then he had a fibrous lump on his chest. You saw the scar there in the opening uh, scene, right? He had, a, he had a fibrous lump that grew really large uh, and was pressing against his lungs, and they couldn't afford medical care. 
And so mom had to be a nurse and a doctor. And they cut it out themselves at home. And as they recounted the story years later, Jesse almost died several times after they cut that out of his chest. But it was from the jaws of death, the pangs of poverty, they would say, and from the evil of racism and prejudice that Jesse, in the face of that adversity, would rise and do great things. In the face of adversity, hate, health problems, financial circumstances, and difficulties, Jesse found life and hope and peace in the face of the most dire circumstances you could imagine. He still found life in the midst of difficulty. Now, although our circumstances are very different from Jesse's, and let me say that clearly, our circumstances, very, very different from Jesse's, but here's what I know. When they're your circumstances, they are difficult circumstances. Are you with me? Other people can say they're not difficult, but if you're the one walking through them and carrying them and carrying them around in your mind, you know this. They are difficult circumstances. To others, it may look like a hill, but to you, it looks like a what? A mountain. In the face of our difficult circumstances, here's what I know. We can still find life, we can still have hope, and we can still find peace and comfort even as we face difficult, dire circumstances. We can find life too. Paul writes it this way in Romans chapter 8. I'll start in verse 28 and read several verses from there. Paul says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. Down to verse 31. If God is for us, who could ever be against us? Since He did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, won't He also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for His own? No one. For God Himself has given us right standing with Himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us and is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. Can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or we're persecuted or hungry or destitute in danger or even threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, verse 37, despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through who? Through Christ. Through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Not death or life, angels or demons, our fears for today or even our worries for tomorrow. Not even the power of hell itself can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the church should have shouted amen at the end of that scripture. That is a beautiful, powerful truth. Nothing can separate us from Jesus. Not the biggest mountain that we face, not anything in life can separate us from the love of Jesus. Nothing can stand against the one who is with us and for us. But even though that's true, we all know this. Life's going to be hard anyway, isn't it? It's going to be difficult. I told you this last week. I'll discourage you again this week. John 16, 33. Jesus says, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here's the discouraging part. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. You know what word I don't like in this passage? Many. I don't like the word many. You will have many trials and many sorrows. That's the difficult discouraging news, but Jesus gives us some encouraging life-giving news. But he says, take heart because I have overcome the world. The world that gives us trouble, Jesus has overcome that world. And if Jesus has overcome the world and he is in me, do you know what that means? I can overcome the world. I can face and overcome the mountains that are in front of me. Psalm 23 verses 4 and 5 says, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. Your rod and staff protect and comfort me, and you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. 
God can give us peace so great that in the midst of our enemies and our battles, we can have enough peace and faith to sit down at a table and eat. God is with us. And if Jesus is with us in the valley of the shadow of death, you know what that means? We can find hope and life and peace even when we walk through the darkest valley, the valley of the shadow of death. He is with us, church. And can I give you the better news? You don't have to have everything together for him to be with you. You don't have to get it right every time for Jesus to love you and be with you. Because he's been with you the whole time anyway. Even before you were in your mother's womb, he knew you. He loves us. And he's with us. You don't have to be a superstar to get God's goodness and his blessings. He has already freely given them. So what should we do? Even in the face of our mountain, even in the face of our difficulty, if we know he is with us, what do we need to do? Let's just keep taking the next step. Let's just keep showing up. Let's, by faith, take the next step. You don't have to have it together to take a step of faith. Because, listen, what if your greatest breakthrough is just on the other side of what feels like your greatest breakdown? What if on the other side of your greatest doubt is your greatest step of faith? You don't have to be a super Christian to take a step of faith and do the good works that God has planned for you to do. How do I know that? Because Ephesians chapter 2 tells me he has already planned these good works in advance for you to do. We just need to take the step and do them. The Bible is filled with zero to hero stories. The Bible is filled with ordinary people doing extraordinary things. From Abraham to Moses to David to every single disciple that followed Jesus and even the Apostle Paul. Every single one of them were flawed. Every single one of them failed. And every single one of them sinned. But you know what God did? He chose them anyway. And not only did he choose them, he worked through them in spite of their flaws and in spite of their failures. I hope this encourages you today. Listen, God chooses common people to do uncommon things. He chooses common people to do uncommon things. And God has chosen you. And God has chosen me. And he loves us. And he believes in us. How do I know he loves us? Jesus, his son, shows me that he loves us. How do I know God believes in me even though I've messed up a million times? Ephesians chapter 2 tells me he's planned good works for me to do in advance, which means he sees me doing them. He sees you doing them. By faith, we need to take that step. God loves us, and God believes in us. And let me ask this question. What would life be like if we chose to see ourselves the way that God sees us? What would change about you if you saw yourself the way God sees you? Because God sees beautiful things in you. Not just the flaws, but God sees what the flaws can become. God sees us and loves us. What if we saw ourselves how he sees us? What if we dared to believe what Jesus says about us? You and I, listen, we have great purpose, great purpose, and we need to step into and walk in that purpose, even in the face of difficulty and mountains. We see this in Jesse's life, looking for a better life and more opportunity. The Owens family decide it might be best for us to leave Alabama, and in that time, that was probably a good move. Are you with me? Good thing for them to do. And so the Owens family pack up from Oakville, Alabama, and they leave. Jesse's around nine years old, I believe. And they move to the land. What is that? Cleveland. They move to Cleveland, Ohio. That's what people from Cleveland call Cleveland, the land, right? Pastor Grant's from Cleveland, Ohio, if you didn't know that. That's why he says pop instead of soda and Coke, all right? When they move to Ohio, Jesse joins the high school track and field team. And it's through that decision, through that move, through all the adversity and difficulty, a door would be open for Jesse to be able to go to college. Would be the first from his family, the first of 10 kids to ever go to college. And he would choose to go to the Ohio State University. 
Okay. O H. Okay, there we go. Almost like we planned that, right? Grant's a big Ohio State guy. I did that for him. So he moved to Ohio. Jesse has an opportunity to go to college, and let's see what happens. Next clip. Ted Lasso is such a good coach, isn't he? <laughs> Jesse Owens could run, and he could jump. But his coach knew, talent will only get you so far. Talent is never enough. Olympic athlete and basketball great Kevin Durant said it this way, hard work beats talent when talent fails to work hard. The great quote. The Apostle Paul said to Timothy, his young protege, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, I love this. He says, but you, talking to Timothy, keep your head in all situations. We'll come back to that in a moment. Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. And then I love this. Do the work. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Do the work. You know what Paul is telling Timothy? Ministry is not about attending. Ministry is about doing the work. To accomplish our purpose and do the good things that God has for us, we must do the work. Can I say this today to a room full of mostly Christians, southern Christians, Praying a prayer to be saved isn't the end goal of Christianity. Evangelical Christianity has done a great job of making that the ultimate goal of our faith, is just to get people saved. But if you really read your New Testament, and you really pay attention to what the people are saying, that statement is never stated. It's never said. Christianity's primary goal isn't just to pray the prayer to get saved and go to church and sing well. I've said this many, many times. Christianity's primary goal is not about a future destination. Christianity's primary goal, it is about present transformation. This is what Christianity is all about. It's about a faith that doesn't long to get us up there, but longs to get up there down here. One that brings heaven to earth. In the eyes of the New Testament writers and even Jesus, heaven isn't an in-game destination. Heaven is about a present reality that is with us here and now. Salvation is free, but to walk in the freedom and life that Jesus has given us, how many of you know there's going to be some work involved? We have to work to walk in that freedom. Being like Jesus, loving like Jesus, Loving your enemies and praying for people who work your nerves. How many of you believe that's hard? And it's going to take work. It's going to require effort. It's why Paul says, do the work. Endure hardship. You know why he uses the word endure? Because most days are going to be a struggle. When you strive to truly follow the way of Jesus, that ain't easy, is it? You're going to have to endure difficult moments. It's going to be hard, but what do we need to do? Keep pressing on. Do the work. Jesse Owens was determined to endure. He did the work. As a student athlete uh, at that level, at that time, Jesse was determined to endure. What you may not understand about the time Jesse lived in, Ohio State University was not desegregated when Jesse went there, which means he couldn't live on campus, Couldn't eat a meal with his white teammates. There were no scholarships available for black athletes, even though Jesse was the best by a mile. You see what I did there, by mile and race, yeah. Even facing those things, Jesse was determined. How does a young man become that determined? You heard it when his coach asked him, can you work? And he tells him, yeah, I can work. I understand work in a way that you don't. Putting the work in in Oakville, picking cotton, facing racism, fighting against all this evil, this is where Jesse learned to endure hardship. But out of this evil that he faced, out of this ugliness that he faced, arose something very powerful and life-changing for Jesse. From evil came something good. Let me say it this way. The very thing the enemy wants to use to destroy you could be the thing that God uses to grow you. Could be the thing. Paul tells Timothy, keep your head in all situations. Do the work. 
You hurt his coach. You don't win with your legs. You win up here. You know what he's telling us? The most important thing is our minds. Our minds direct our lives. My mind, your mind, this is the battlefield. It's why Paul says to Timothy, keep your head in all situations because the easiest thing to do is to lose your marbles in a lot of situations. Are you with me? You need to keep your head. You need to think rightly. Paul would say it this way in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. The longer I live in this world, I know this. The world pushes me to think like the world thinks. Paul speaks against this. He says, don't get caught up in the way of the thinking of the world, but instead be countercultural in your thinking. Here's a great question to ask. How can I be countercultural in my thinking? This is where I would start. We need to remember the teachings of Jesus. We need to remember the Sermon on the Mount. This is the greatest teaching we need to follow right? The call to love your enemies. The call to pray for your enemies. When we follow the way of Jesus and not just talk about it or sing about it or attend it, but when we truly follow the way of Jesus, we are transformed. We are transformed in our minds. That word uh, transformed, it's the Greek word metamorpho. It's where we get our word what? metamorphosis, right? This is the kind of transformation that Paul is speaking about when we just begin to change the way that we think. As we follow the way of Jesus, we are changed, we are transformed. And if our mind is transformed, then our lives will always follow suit. How do I know that's true? We all know this. Everything begins with a thought, doesn't it? Everything. Before you decide, before I decide to pick this up, It happened as a thought before I did it. Everything in life begins with a thought. Before an action is taken, it begins as a thought. And so what we do with our minds and the way that we think, how many would agree, it matters. It is of the utmost importance. I've said this many, many times. I'll say it again today. Why does this matter? Because your life, my life, it's always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. Always. What we think matters. And we need to be transformed in our thinking, and this is the reality. You cannot have a negative mind and a positive life at the same time. You cannot. So what do we need to do? We need to change up here first. It's why Paul tells Timothy, keep your head in all situations. If you want to endure, you got to keep your head first. That's why Paul mentions it that way. Keep your head in all situations. For Jesse... As we get ready for this third clip, Jesse was battling uh, some injuries, but really a back injury that was threatening to derail him. And if you watch the film, he was in a tizzy over it, right? He was all worked up in his mind, and they were going to the Big Ten Championship, and his mind was the battlefield. And let's see how Jesse handles this. That's what's known as the greatest 45 minutes in sports history. Three world records. Should have been four, but he tied another one at 9.4 seconds. Jesse, he just didn't have the talent. He put in the hard work. He won up here in his mind. And what was the results for him? Not only did it pave the way for him, Jesse would pave the way for so many future African-American athletes to dream and to have courage and to rise up to. Jesse inspired so many people and change the perspectives of those who needed to be changed. Jesse, his purpose was not just for him. His purpose was for others, too. Church, know this today. Our purpose is not just for us. It's also meant to impact the people around us. Now, this movie is about racing and running a race, and I feel like it would be unchristian of me not to read this Bible verse uh, today that Paul wrote from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Paul says this, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? And I love what he says next. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Run with purpose. 
run with passion. What is Paul saying? Do the work. Endure. Run to win the prize. Let me ask this question today. If you're a follower of Jesus, are you following him? How many of you think it's probably a good idea if we're followers of Jesus that we follow Jesus? Paul says, are you running the race? Are you really following Jesus? Are you really living for Jesus? If you have confessed Jesus as Lord, are you living like he really is Lord? Are you running the race? And I think what determines that and what the bigger question is, is this, what's my prize? What's my purpose? What am I running after? Just me and the things I want? Or is my life pointed towards Jesus and the things that he has commanded and called me to? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Now, Jesse, his prize wasn't just to go to the Olympics and make it. He wanted to win gold medals. This is what motivated him. The 1936 Olympics, as you heard, were in Berlin under the regime of Adolf Hitler, the proponent of the Aryan race who believed that white is superior, and we all know the atrocities that took place from that perverted way of thinking. Jesse, as he goes to Berlin, he expects discrimination. He expects hatred from there. But what he wasn't expecting before he left was resistance from here. This is our last clip for today. Powerful scene. Sometimes adversity can come from places where you never expect it to come. It happened to Jesse with the guy from the NAACP. And it even happened from, from his dad. Even if you go and bring home a drawer full of medals, nobody's going to notice anyway. That's tough. He had a big decision that he had to make. And the guy said to Jesse, right as it was ending, God gave you a great gift. Maybe he'll tell you how to use it. And God did tell him. And he did make it. And Jesse decided this way. If I have a gift from God, I need to use the gift that God has given me. That was his decision. Jesse knew an unused gift is a wasted gift. Jesse had to choose to believe. You know what? I'm going to use my gift, and I'm going to believe that if I use what God has given me, God will bless it. And it will make a difference, and people will notice. Even if the masses don't, somebody will. And so Jesse decided to use his gift. And there is no doubt, as you know the results, and spoiler warning here at the 1936 Olympics, Jesse chose to use his gift, and he ran in the face of hatred and racism and violence and unbelief. Jesse won four gold medals at the 1936 Olympics. And here's the even more powerful thing. The world noticed because Jesse showed up. Jesse faced what was in front of him and used his God-given gifts. It made a difference. Jesse lived out his purpose. And when he did, you heard him, he felt the most free then. There is no greater satisfaction in life than us living out God's purpose for our lives. Whatever God has put in front of us, this is what we must follow. And you may say, well, Pat, God hasn't spoken to me about my specific gift or purpose. Let me say this to you today. You don't have to know specifically this or that. Can I run? Can I do this? Jesus has already told us something to do. And wherever our feet are, this is the purpose we are to carry out in whatever we do. He tells us, a new commandment I give you, love one another. How? Jesus says, in the way that I have loved you, you are to love one another. This is our purpose. And whether we're at work, at home, doing hobbies, wherever we may be, wherever our feet are, do you know what our purpose is as the people of God? To love others the way that Jesus has loved us. 
self-giving, co-suffering, radically forgiving. This is the great purpose for God's people. And we will find the most joy and peace and purpose in life when we are following the way of Jesus. Josh, you can come back. Paul says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Let me ask this question and then we'll pray. Are you running the race? Are you really living for Jesus? If you confess him as Lord, are you living like he really is Lord? Would you honestly consider that today? If I'm a Christ follower, am I following Christ? Not do I attend church, but in my everyday going about town life, am I following Jesus truly? Could we pray today? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And as you ponder that question, Christ follower, this is just what I would say. If you would be honest and say, Pat, I haven't been following Christ. I've been following my own way and doing my own thing. I know the command and the call of Jesus to love others the way he's loved me, but I have not been doing that. I haven't been living like he's Lord. And if that's the reality today, Here's the good news. You can repent right where you are. Repent of that. What does that mean? A change of mind with a change of direction. If you haven't been following, today is a great day to confess that to God, to ask and receive his great forgiveness and mercy, and then to be made a new creation, and to commit. If you confessed him as Lord, follow him. Christ followers ought to follow Christ. And if that's the decision you need to make today, to come back to him, to repent, right where you are, would you make it? You don't need me to do anything, to pray anything. You confess that to God. Repent right where you are. And maybe today you need to take a step of faith towards Jesus. If for the first time, Paul says it this way, If you declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God. It's by declaring by faith that you are saved. Verse 13 of Romans 10 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you need to call on his name and be saved, begin your faith journey in Christ today. Right where you are, would you just confess that belief? Would you confess him as Lord? right where you are, and you will be saved. God, we thank you today for this opportunity we've had to gather, to experience your goodness together as a church, as the people of God. We thank you that you are here, and that you are moving and you are working, even if we can't see it, Lord. God, you are good and you are always working. And in view of that mercy, help us, your people, to offer our lives to you as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you. This is our reasonable act of worship. This is what we should give in view of what you have given to us. Help us as Christians to truly follow Christ. This is our prayer today. And we thank you for your grace and mercy as we stumble along the way that you are still with us. And you offer grace to us then. Lord, help us to follow. We thank you for this today. In the name of Jesus, amen.